All right, welcome to this video, which is going to be aimed at some of you who are trying to set up your own custom image processing pipelines, or just need a quick tool to say resize a volume or an image, add some noise, simulate some data, or calculate an FSC, whatever it might be. My name is Ben Himes. I'm the host of the crowd to go pod and also this crowd to go YouTube channel. Uh, a handful of you may know that I like tomography quite a bit. I work on EM Clarity and also am one of the uh, developers on the system project. So today what I wanted to introduce to you was a new addition to the documentation I've been working on for some time called the System Docs, which uh, has its own GitHub repository. I welcome any additions, uh, but of course the actual documentation itself is a statically linked page that you can come to and find some information uh, that expands a little bit on what's otherwise available for the single particle package. So I'll just point out quickly on system.org, which is the official version uh, of the lab's website. So you can see down here, I'm a computer vision specialist. I work in the Gregorief lab with Nico uh, and our other colleagues, and we're right now at UMass Chan Medical School. Uh, but system itself was developed by Alexi Rohu, Tim Grant, and Nico originally. Uh, and then I've been doing quite a bit of work over the last few years uh, in system. So this is the officially supported web page with the uh, supported version, which is still called System 1.0 Beta. Uh, so I'll be introducing programs that are available with System 1 Beta that you already have if you have System installed, and how you can take advantage of some of those in your documentation. Uh, if you don't link through my GitHub, you can also go from the system web page under documentation. If you go to the table of contents and scroll to developmental versions, uh, you'll read this nice little blurb. System is continually being developed to add new features. Interested users can access developmental versions of system here. And it just redirects to the same page. So this is both a page full of information, uh, but it also links you out to some uh, current builds that I've put together that give you access to the um, the developmental versions without having to compile it yourself. So a brief word about these docs. Uh, in addition to single particle, you know, we're also interested uh, quite strongly in in-situ particle detection, uh, as well as tomography, so single um, sing subtomogram averaging, but also tomography just from a more classic standpoint to hopefully provide context for these particle detections and look at, you know, what I guess was coined uh, visual proteomics. And I also have a pretty strong interest in sort of the, you know, physical image formation model that describes what goes on when electrons interact with our specimen in the microscope. I'm not going to talk about this at all today, but there'll be videos and I'm sure pods about this in the kind of near future. So each of these main categories has its own uh, little section, all with the same topics and introduction, so tutorials, reference material, discussions, and how-to guides. Now, a lot of these are blank right now um, because obviously this is a lot of work for one person to be doing uh, in addition to, quote, my day job. Uh, but, you know, there's a handful of things like if you want to maybe try out template matching for yourself under the in-situ particle detection, you know, sorry, maybe start with the intro. Oh, that's linking to the wrong thing. I'll have to file that. So that should introduce our paper. So is this in here? Nope. Oh, okay. Strike two. Anyway, if you go to the tutorials, um, we've got a set of template matching tutorials that give you some scripts. Uh, for example, you just copy and paste this if you wanted to or download it. They'll take you step by step through, you know, downloading the PDB model, how to process the data, showing you how to set up your project and going through and actually getting to a point where you can pick some particles. But that's not what we want to talk about today. We're going to talk about this section that I just added in the reference material for single particle CryoEM, although these tools could be used for projects, obviously, that aren't at all related to single particle. They're just CryoEM images or uh, volumes. And these uh, define just some basic reference material for the programs that are available in system. So when you download system and put it into your computer, we have it statically compiled so that you don't really need anything else to add, you just download the binaries and you're good to go. And if you run system, you're familiar, you just type on your command line or maybe you've linked a, um, you could link a GUI icon if you wanted to click. It opens up system and you're good to go. But system is just one of about 40 programs that are included 
in the system package. Uh, and a lot of these are called from the GUI itself, but you can also call them from the command line. And they basically all do, you know, simple little things like, for example, calculate FSC takes two volumes and calculates an FSC between them. You know, pretty straightforward. Uh, so if we flip through these, you can see <clears throat> they provide a brief summary of what the program does, whether or not there's command line options, which for almost all of these there aren't. Uh, if you have a question about why that is, go ahead and drop it down below and I'll try and get back to you. Uh, but then it defines the interactive options and sort of what they're about. Now that in itself, uh, I think is fairly useful, but where it comes in really handy is the search function because this is just a Jupyter book, everything's accessible. So if I say I wanted to calc, calculate an FSC, um, interestingly, calc FSC did not show up because I didn't write a good uh, description, I guess, but sharpen map does. Um, well, that's interesting. Sharpen a map by flattening. No, yeah, that's right. Can also apply statistics calculated from calculate FSC. Uh, and then that would link you over to calculate FSC and you can figure this out. So I do need to figure out a little bit better how to maybe add some keywords into these summaries so that the search function is more useful. Uh, but even still something like, say I want to resample a volume to change its pixel size, uh, it sticks out a handful of different options, uh, which are fairly, I think, straightforward. So these are here, they're already available for you to use. And what I thought I'd do today is just run through a couple examples of what this looks like and how you might use some of these in your own work. All right. So we'll pop over and I've just made this directory with a handful of things. So first to show you sort of what the inputs are that we're working with. All right, so we've got a map that I simulated here from a beta gal PDB at one action per pixel. And this is sort of the default view that comes out. So it's aligned with the symmetry axis. This is D2 symmetry aligned to the XYZ coordinate planes. And then we've got a second volume where the symmetry axes are not aligned. Uh, and you'll see why I'm using these two different volumes as we work through this. All right, so for the first example, I want to show you, let's see which of these would be good to start with. So let's start with something simple and we will resample our volume. So as I mentioned just a minute ago, I simulated these at a one angstrom pixel size. So what I'm gonna do is just call the program from the command, command line, not resample, but resample. And use a little tab completion there. So if system's on your path so that it comes up if you type system, all these other programs will also come up. And you see, it just gives you a little bit of interactive information. It tells you what kind of computer you're running on. Welcome to insert program name, uh, when it was compiled, the particular version of system, blah, blah, blah. This is all, you know, kind of useful, especially if you're scripting uh, to have this stuff print out. All right, so I'm going to resample or bin this off axis beta gal. So I'm just giving it the name, uh, just calling it generically output.mrc. I want to tell it it is a volume. If it was a 2D image, you would just leave this as the default, which is no. Now I'm going to change the pixel size to 64. Now I know ahead of time that this is a 256 cube because that's how I made it. You could use any one of a number of different programs to interrogate the MRC header, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, so I won't point those out. Uh, but why I'm choosing 64, let's just go down to the documentation for resample. I guess I already have it up here. So in the summary, it gives you, you know, changes the pixel size of a volume based on a change in the size. So what it's doing is it's taking the Fourier transform, then it's changing the size of the transform, which changes the sampling frequency rate. So in this case, I old size is 256 divided by the new size, 64 is four, and I multiply by all the pixel size. So my new pixel size is gonna be four. Uh, it doesn't have to be, I mean, these need to be integers because pixels are integers. You know, it's a discrete thing, but your change in pixel size, this could be like, you know, 2.5 if I used 100 or whatever that works out, 2.56. So I'm going to use 64, and the reason I'm choosing this is just to make it a decent bit smaller. That way, when I go to run a line symmetry axis, which is the next thing I'll introduce, things go nice and quick. So 
let's take a quick look. I'll just use iMod, so output, and then take my input, which is theta gal off axis. I'm just gonna flick between these two volumes. You see there's my original one action per pixel and my much, much smaller bin version at four inches per pixel. So it looks like things worked out well. All right, so that's resample. Uh, there's a resize, which I won't demonstrate here today, but it instead of changing the size in Fourier space, which changes the pixel size, just changes the box size in real space, which can be pretty useful. Uh, say, for example, you have the input to a neural net you're training. Uh, typically, when you set those up, they are expecting a given image size. So if you downloaded a bunch of maps from the PDB, you might need to both resize and resample to get them to be the same pixel sampling rate and the same box size. Uh, in fact, now that I'm saying that out loud, I think what I'll do, uh, these are interactively run from the command line, but another nice thing that you can do is you can really easily stitch these together in your own uh, Bash or Python scripts, or really whatever language you want, but let's just say Bash and Python. Uh, so I'll make another video that uh, does both of those and shows you an example of how to do what I just described there. Um, download a couple maps from the PDB, or sorry, from the EMDB in this case, because we're starting with maps, and make sure that they have at the end the same pixel size and box size. But for now, uh, let's check out this uh, align symmetry function. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna take that off axis guy. Ooh, actually, <laughs> let me show you this other program first real quick, because this will be a good setup. You can tell I thought through this, but didn't really do any kind of practice, so. Um, this ortho views function is pretty cool. You know, I could see where it might come in handy either for making slides for a lab meeting or maybe even for a paper, but what it gives you out, uh, we'll let's just run it and then we'll describe it. So I'm just gonna say ortho. Oh, that's not working. All right, so I've made the director name ortho views. Uh, maybe some of you don't know, when you're running from the command line in get bash anyway, you can do a reverse search of your history with control R. That's a super useful tip. So I'm gonna say control R and I'm just gonna type ortho. So that's not useful. And if you continue to hit control R, it scrolls through your or older commands that you've run. Ah, okay, so the program's actually named make ortho views, which if I had looked over the documentation, um, I guess I would have seen, yeah, right there. I'm bad at the alphabet, but there's make ortho views. All right, so I'm gonna hit enter and run that. And again, we're starting from our that one that was on the left initially in Chimera that was off axis. And let's just, instead of iMod, I'm gonna look at this with TDisp, which is just a little bit cleaner for some displays. Okay, so you can see we've got a, let me uh, change the contrast a little. The output is two rows. One is a slice through the density on the X, Y, Z axis. The other is a projection through the density on the x, y, z axis. So really it's a slice through the real space and then a slice through the Fourier transform, transform back into the real space. And just to convince you that that's doing what I say it's doing, let's run it again. But this time I will run it on the one that should already be aligned. Oop, not off axis, sorry. Just betagal.mrc. Yeah, we'll leave it, I give it a new name, ortho.mrc, okay. Now tdisp ortho.mrc. Aha, the system works. So now you can see, I think pretty clearly that whatever we have here has got some symmetry. You're not gonna see the mirror symmetry, I think, but you can certainly see the twofold symmetry axes. So now what if you have a protein that looks like the first one we just had that isn't aligned, and what you want is something that is nicely aligned like this. Now we come back to this program Align symmetry. And this does exactly what it is described in the summary here. So let's just pop up. Align symmetry, and this is sort of summary. The program attempts to align an unsymmetrized volume to a symmetry axis that corresponds to the definitions used in system, right? Now, in addition to aligning this thing, it also gives you a volume that outputs the symmetrized image. So let's say you don't actually need to align it, right? Let's say you have something that is a volume that hasn't had symmetry applied to it, but you think is already aligned to the symmetry axis. 
you could just run this program and give it a very large grid search so it's very fast and then basically effectively use it to cheat and apply the symmetry. Not really cheat, but you know, only use half of its output. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so we will call line symmetry. All right, so now I'm going to use this resampled volume where we bend it by four and tell the symmetry. So there we have the aligned volume, so it's aligned to the symmetry axis and also aligned with the symmetry also applied to it. Now that's not gonna make a difference in this example because it's already a symmetrized volume. Uh, the default angular search step is five degrees, which may be important for some proteins uh, because this is basically noise free. Uh, we can give it a very coarse angular search. It's gonna find the right angles. Uh, and the reason to do that is just, you know, it's a video, you don't wanna sit here and stare at this thing tick away. All right, so for the outputs, we get a set of degrees to be honest, I'm not sure why we're saying X, Y, and Z rotations. Um, system, along with most other programs, uses Euler angles that are like Z, Y, Z, um, or like uh, Chimera and DM Clarity use the X, Z, as well as Protomo. I mean, they're all similar, but X, Y, Z, that's sort of like the, maybe the inverse of what you would see in a slicer view in iMod, I guess. I think that's Z, Y, X. But that's just the difference between flipping between intrinsic and X, sorry, I'm, <laughs> headed down a rabbit hole there. Let's not talk about rotations, they're a headache, um, which I'm sure you've heard me say before. But you don't really need to know what those are, at least in this case. What we just wanna do is look at, actually let's make an ortho view of our symmetrized. Yeah, can type. All right, so my volume aligned, right? And we're just gonna output ortho views. So let's open up our input, which I'm just gonna scroll up in the terminal, which was this guy. Oh, I'm sorry, that's a volume. Oh dear. So let's make an ortho view for that too. And we'll call this non-ally MFC. All right, so let's look at these two things together. So there's non-ally and then the aligned version. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, there we go. Got my act together. Sorry about that. So let's just zoom in a little. So since it's been by four, it's nice and small. So the input, not aligned to the symmetry axis, just like we had before. But now, if you see, we've done the alignment. Although the axes themselves are not the same as the other volume that we looked at in the very first example, because they're degenerate, it doesn't really, this program has no sense of what is X, Y, or Z. It's just doing a brute force search to say, find the thing that looks the most like itself when aligned in this orientation. So because there's multiple symmetry axes here, you know, depending on the starting point, uh, this view might actually be along X instead of Y, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. They're still aligned along these axes. Okay. So that is line symmetry. And we've also checked out resample and ortho views. Uh, so let's look at another function. Um, the directory is not aptly named here, but if we go into our documentation and let's say we make some sort of projections, oh boy, we've got lots of options here. So one thing I'm trying to figure out how to do, uh, hold on just a moment. That was the freight company calling to schedule a delivery for tomorrow for something that was delivered yesterday while I was at work. Super. Anyway, um, coming back to it, we have, oh yes, this over, so let's say, let's say projection. Maybe that helps a little bit. Research. All right, tutorials. Ah, project 3D. Good. So we want to create a stack of 2D projections at either random angles or from angles and shifts with an optional CTF applied provided in a star file. You can also optionally add Gaussian noise. So let's check this out. This might be useful if you are, you know, making a stack of, you know, roughly simulated or simply simulated data to use for training a neural net or uh, some other comparison. So what we'll do is we'll call this program project 3D. For an input, I'm going to use that beta gal that was aligned to the symmetry axis. So I'm not gonna use a star file. So let's real quick flip back over and see what would happen if I had said, yes, let's use a star file. 
So you can see in the docs, it's going to say, if you say yes to this option, it's going to ask you for an input star file name and give you some description and some other options here. It also gives you an option to apply the CTF, which is not an option if you don't use the star file. Uh, this also allows you to use a set defocus for each, de uh, for each particle uh, and a different angle and offset. The option we're going to use, though, is a little bit simpler. Whoa, hey. Uh, we're going to say no. And then because we've said no, it's just going to ask us for an angular step. I'm going to give it 10. Just You'd have to think about that if you were going to use it. But for the case of demonstration, that should work pretty well. Uh, pixel size of 1. No mask. Um, let's give it, we'll leave the SNR there, but I'm actually going to turn it off for the first state. All right, setting this padding factor to one instead of two, which is the default. I'll explain why in the next uh, example. Uh, particle symmetry, which we know, no mask, and I'm not going to add noise for the first try. Uh, now, some programs in the system are multi-threaded, and that's usually the last option that will pop up in the interactive. So I'm just going to use 16 threads here. Uh, it's very fast anyway, but just to illustrate, it's basically instant. And let's take a look at that. What do we call it? Uh, my projection stack. All right. So we've got basically a noise-free image going through all these random angles. But you see all this ghosting out on the outside. So that's something we want to get rid of. So what that happens there, that's just a, a wraparound effect that you get because we're using the Fourier slice theorem to calculate these projections. And a discrete Fourier transform is considered to basically implicitly be infinitely periodic. Uh, so you get information from one edge wrapping to the information on the other. And the way we typically deal with that is by adding padding. So we'll come back down to this padding factor. I'm going to say 2. Everything else constant. And you see that when you run a program interactively with system, it remembers your options. There's just this, um, so ls minus a shows hidden things. This dot program name dot dff, it's just a text file. And it stores uh, basically the options you had run through. Uh, and this is another way that like if you were going to set up a script, which you know I'll make another video for, you would basically run through once interactively, take this dff, and then you modify things uh, and I'll, well, again, separate video. All right, so let's look at this output. My projection stack, let's keep the name the same. And if everything worked, which it did, we got rid of basically all that ghosting. Great. All right, so now I'm going to do this one more time, but I'm going to add Gaussian noise to it. Let's actually make this something a little bit more realistic and say... So it's a 1 to 20 signal to noise ratio, uh, padding factor, and I do want to add noise. So these yeses and nos are not case sensitive. Um, if you're feeling particularly vocal, you can do all caps. It's uh, entirely up to you. This will take just a tiny bit longer. Yep, okay. And doing that reverse search again, just to make life easy. Okay, so you can see we've got uh, a bunch of Gaussian noise added. Particle still stands out reasonably clearly, but this is, I'd say, fairly representative of what we might expect for a uh, CryoEM image. Great. So we've made some fake noisy images. I want to show you a couple more of these, and then we'll call it a day. So we want to go to Apply CTF. Well, you don't have to go to the directory. You could call this anywhere. I've just made these to keep my life a little cleaner. Um, and this particular program doesn't have an underscore. I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, and we might go ahead and fix that in the future, but I want to apply the CTF. Now I'm going to apply it to that projection stack, that noisy one I just made. Uh, this is all the same. It needs to know about the microscope parameters, so I'm just giving it sort of default for what we'd have for a Krios. Uh, no text file for defocus, and here I was shouting at it with the caps, but if we look back uh, at the docs here, if I had said that yes, I would need a text file that has three or four values per line, one line per particle, and it would give a defocus one, two, and a stigmatism angle, and optionally a phase shift. Uh, because I'm not giving it a file, I'm just going to tell it these things from the command line. So in some programs, if you 
based on how you answer these things, uh, the options that you're presented with will change. So I'm just going to go with 1.2 microns, 1 1.4, 30 degrees doesn't really matter. And to start, I'm just only going to apply a phase shift. Let's maintain the image contrast, actually. So let's look at output.mrc. Oops. So we're going to do that again. I misunderstood myself what that option did. So I'll have to add that to the docs. So maintain image contrast meant it basically multi it applied to the phase flip, but then it multiplied by negative one. So here I was thinking that it meant that it would maintain the, um, the scaling of the image. Ah, there we go. So now as we expect, we've applied a phase flip. We've got a dark particle instead of a light particle, which was what you expect in a bright field microscopy image. So let's keep that open. And we are going to do the same thing, but now we're going to do a different option. And this is the only other option available in the released beta version. We'll say no to phase flip only. Now, if you're, in, if you're using the beta version, you won't get the supply wiener filter option, but I'll show you what that is and how to get that from the alpha version uh, right after I do this. So if we're not only applying the phase flip, that means we're multiplying by the CTF, and you'll see we get something that looks a little more realistic in terms of a cryoEM image. Well, that's not right. All right, well, I guess if you look at the screen here, you can say I actually said yes to the supply wiener filter. So spoiler alert, that's what it's gonna look like. And this is just a, basically the low resolution wiener filter emphasizing, um, the wiener filter that emphasizes the low resolution during CTFD convolution. Um, so I'll tell you what, we'll skip, we'll skip the thing in the middle and just talk about this for a second. So this was something that uh, Dmitry Teganov so I'm just coming off of his GitHub over here. Uh, proposed, uh, this is his example, of taking a no faceplate image and then applying this deconvolution uh, and comparing it to a faceplate image. Uh, if that's something anyone would want to have explained how that works, uh, that could be another video or maybe a tutorial or I'm not sure the format that would be best for that. But if, you, if that's something you're interested in, you could leave it in the comments below and I'll see if we can make some time for it. Uh, but this sort of thing you may have also seen, it's included in EM Clarity as the fake phase plate option. Um, and it's also in the newer versions of system, which let's take a quick look at that. All right, so I'm just gonna open a recent project I was working on, calling system from the command line. We'll go with this list. All right, so let's just look at the results from particle picking. And you can see, obviously you can see the apoferritin pretty clearly, no matter what, super thin ice, nice dark particle, but you see that this Wiener filter option is here. So traditionally in system, you might just be able to low pass, but now in addition, you can also turn on this Wiener filter, which really helps, uh, particularly when you have smaller proteins kind of jump out a bit from the background. Okay, so these are all doing the same thing. They're just doing a, a Wiener filter with uh, deconvolution. But uh, if you wanted to apply that to some images, either for you know, analysis in your project, if you wanted to use it for slides for a group meeting or even a figure, uh, you could download the MATLAB script that Dimitri has, or you could use this program, Apply CTF. Um, that may actually be useful enough to make another small video or tutorial that explains the uh, how you would script together something like CTF estimation and apply CTF into one, basically what would look like one command. All right, I'm just gonna show maybe one more thing here real quick. Because unfortunately my voice is suffering from the dry air and all this talking. So I'm running out of steam. But let's check out real quickly a sharpened map. All right, so this is a program that if we flip over, got a little sloppy mess here. If we flip over the docs, let's just use the search again. Uh, 
All right, so it's a map that you can use to flatten the power spectrum at high resolution. So basically reweighting the Fourier amplitudes. And you can optionally also apply an additional B factor, either to sharpen or dampen those high resolution features. All right, so in this example, I'm not going to sharpen the map. What I actually want to do is blur it. So I am going to say sharpen map. Let's see if it will tab complete. No. Oh, I just opened this window because I closed the tab. So to load system. All right, sharpen map. All right, so I'm now going back to something that I guess I've resized. So one thing I didn't mention, and you would see this in the docs, is that the resize program also optionally will allow you to set the mean and the variance of your map. So these simulations that I'm using as inputs have extremely low density values. It's something like you know 10 to the negative fourth because they represent the actual projected Coulomb potential, which is very small. Um, but for the next step and the final step that I'm going to show you, which is making basically an envelope shaped mask, we need to know what sort of cutoff value to start with. And for that, it helps a lot to have things set to be a mean of zero a standard deviation of one. So I've used the resize and I took it from 256 and kept it at 256. But then I said, please normalize these values. So now instead of having these really tiny values, most of the values are distributed, you know, around zero and between, let's say, plus or minus three. All right, so I'm using that as my input. I'm giving it a mask, just the default name, mask.mrc, but I'm going to tell it not to apply it later. Same with these reconstruction statistics. These would be output by Calculate FSC, and they can be used to apply a figure of merit weight to appropriately visualize only the features that are supported by the resolution estimate by the FSC. But we don't particularly care about that. That's overkill for what we're doing here. So I'm gonna say, no, don't use the statistics. My pixel size is still one. I'm not going to apply a mask, so I just leave these at zero. Now here I'm applying a low resolution B factor. So this basically means lower than a cutoff we're about to give. So I think I have it set at eight angstroms. We're going to apply a positive B factor. So this will dampen things. Of 1500 and that's roughly a cutoff of around 22 angstroms resolution is where it drops basically down to nothing so it's a pretty strong low pass filter I'm not going to apply a high res B factor because that's all going to be lost and uh, in these two cases this low resolution limit for spectral flattening that would be anything above that so if I had said say 8 which is the default uh, anything from 8 out to, in this case, 2 angstroms, which is the Nyquist for this map, the power spectrum would be changed so that it was basically flat. And that's to, in keeping with roughly what we think things should look like based on Wilson's statistics. Um, as an aside, if you go ahead and you actually calculate the, um, the scattering factor for a protein, it should actually still have a slight slope to it. So... This flattening is very common in the field, but it's really not quite right, and I think it's something that probably should be fixed. Anyway, that's a whole other story in and of itself. So filter edge width, this is just the cosine edge that is used in system in a lot of different places if you're masking, and this is sort of the default. And we don't need to know about this, uh, but if you have questions, go ahead and post them, or you can even post them on the, the GitHub for the documentation. This would fit in the category where you know, we have reference material, which is just saying, this is what a function does. This would kind of go in the discussion section, uh, which most of those are basically empty right now. But the intent there is to expand upon, you know, a bit more of a learning resource. Like, I, well, why is that the number we use? Why is that default? So not just what am I doing programmatically, but what am I doing logically? Anywho, uh, and I guess the thing I should point out while I'm on that topic is if you go to the front page of this book, there's two columns, request new documentation or report bugs. So in this particular interest if, example, if you said, well, I want to know why, why is the default cosine edge cut off 20 angstroms? What does that even mean? And why'd you pick it? So you might go to, you know, if you do not find the information you need, please request. So you fill out, how do I request? Which will take you to the issues page of the GitHub repo for the system documentation, the system developmental documentation. And there's this 
what I think is this nice little template. So you would say this is about maybe single particle cry OEM, put a little X there, uh, describe the solution you'd like. And there's, you know, it kind of spells it out for you. You don't have to do all this stuff, but it's useful for me. Uh, if you're not familiar with Markdown or GitHub, you can flip between these two tabs to see how the, um, the highlighting actually works. So you see this is bold, and that's because it's highlighted with double asterisks. If I made it a single asterisk, it should be italic. Ah, yes, the system works. And you can just search Markdown Syntax. GitHub uses a slightly different flavor, so some things work, some things don't. Uh, but you always have this preview tab to see what it's going to actually look like once you post that issue. Okay. So we'll come back to our actually running. I'm not using this 3D mask. And another thing that you might use this program for, even if you don't do any sharpening, so you could set all the B factors to zero, is just to invert the handedness of your map. So say you go through your processing, you know, single particle is basically agnostic until you get to a resolution where you're doing evolved sphere correction uh, to knowing what the handedness really is. So I'm not going to invert the handedness because I know it's right, and I also don't care for this example. All right, so our output, let's take a look at that. And then we're getting close to the end. Oop. Oh, new windows. Ah, yes. Nice. All right. Sorry for that there. All right, well, that'll be a test of the new microphone. I'm not sure if you guys heard the dogs there, but there was a squirrel. Whoa. All right, so looking at the, the output here, you can see this is much more blurred than what we started with. Uh, and I'm going to use that as input to the final program I'm going to show you. And you could play around with this with different B factors, or you could calculate just uh, with a simple plot to see you know, how that translates to a resolution cutoff. I think it would be pretty useful, actually, to be able to say cutoff at 20 angstroms, but that doesn't exist right now in system anyway. All right, so for the final thing, I'm going to show you this program called Make Size Map. All right, so I've now got this map that I used resize to normalize the image statistics, zero and one, and then I blurred it using Sharpen Map. So now I'm going to come in and call this Make Size Map program. And what this does is it basically creates a mask that looks like your protein. So going back to this, I'm just gonna skip through these real quick. Uh, so it takes this threshold binarized cutoff, does this thing called run length encoding, and then it makes its map. And I think this is not going to be what I wanted it to be. Oh no, that did work out. Okay, so I'm coming in and, ah, I see. So I re-ran and resize and blurred this guy. So it's basically giving you a mask. Now it's tight on the edges, so you wouldn't wanna use this insane FSC calculation. But if you were just trying to isolate, you know, what are the intensity values inside the sharp envelope of this protein, uh, then I could use something like this. If I wanted to use an FSC, it would need to be coupled to some blurring to smooth out these edges so that doesn't introduce any kind of correlation. But that's not so important. The important thing is you can basically isolate connected densities first with a cutoff and then using this run length encoding to go through. All right, so that's just a little bit of a whirlwind to show you some of the different tools that are available as these little standalone things in system. As you can see, there's many more of them. Uh, so let's go back to this single particle reference programs and system beta. So we looked at a handful of these, you know, we didn't look at calculate FSC, but I think that should be pretty obvious what it does. You can convert TIFF files to MRC, uh, CTF find and unblur are both well documented. So I didn't put anything in for them. Uh, and then there's some other functions that are pretty specific to how the GUI works. So for example, if we want to make a reconstruction with a million particles and we have 10 different computers to use, we would reconstruct 100,000 particles on each computer and then run this program Merge 3D to add those reconstructions together, uh, which I guess in reality, I should put at least that in the summary, but there's like 20 command line options and I just, that's a lot of formatting to deal with. So I didn't want to put that in here, but I did link to the source code Ah, <laughs> or I did not. All right, now this is good, this is a teachable moment. So if you find what I would call a bug, so normally we think of a bug image processing like, oh, it gives me the wrong image. Here's a bug for documentation, the link is clearly broken. So what you would do, 
I would just, let's copy this URL, which is the page of the book I'm on right now. And we'll go back to this intro. So we said, here's a new feature request, but there's also a link if you find a bug, like a broken link, yeah, like foreshadowing. Please report using this form. So this one's just a little bit different. So we give it a title, um, broken merge 3D link. I describe the bug. I mean, in this case, it's pretty straightforward. Link gives 404 error. You know, if this was a image processing problem, maybe the description is more complicated. Uh, and then quickly look at the preview. Yeah, I've just outlined these steps. So let's say go to link. Uh, so instead of just pasting the hyperlink, you see, go to this page and it gives me a link. This is the syntax. So you got square brackets around the text, regular parentheses around the actual link. Um, and, you know, I think everything else is fairly clear. So there's a lot of details in here, but I'm not going to fill any of that out because A, I'm filing it so I know what I'm doing. And B, I think this is honestly enough. I mean, I can reproduce and I know what to expect. I expect a 404 error. So I'm going to submit this new issue. Good. All right, so now this issue is on the page. I've seen that it is a bug. So it, this template already labels it. And I'll actually get an email notification, which is more useful if someone else submits it because I know this is now there. But I now have a note to go and fix this and then I can get rid of this uh, issue report. Um, you can of course do those sorts of things on the actual system page uh, or the EM Clarity page for that matter. Uh, but today we're just talking about the documentations, which again, you can find either linking through system.org developmental documentation, or you can link from my GitHub homepage uh, right here with system docs. All right. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to learn a little bit about how you can take advantage of these small command line program tools to do little bits of image processing that you might need in your own pipelines that you're coming up with in whatever creative way you're doing. All right. Until next time.